everybody! Welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast, episode 29, where it is our mission to create worlds out of words. I'm Hannah Heath, the PFW Multimedia Manager, and I'm joined today by my fellow PFW authors E.B. Dawson and J.E. Perazzi. We are going to talk about the do's and don'ts of indie author professionalism, but before we get into all of that, let's do introductions. Hi, I am J.E. Prazzi. I'm the managing editor of PFW, and I am the writer of the Malfunction Trilogy. As mentioned, I'm Hannah Heath, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of the Torn Universe, a fantasy and sci-fi expanded universe that contains stories such as the Terrapinth Tree Chronicles and This Pain Inside. And I'm E.B. Dawson, editor-in-chief at the Phoenix Fiction Writers author of the Creation of Jack series, the Lost Empire Trilogy, and Watson and Holmes. Yes, which actually leads us into our news segment. Beth, would you like to talk about this amazing Watson and Holmes? Watson and Holmes is almost out, I believe, or it'll come out pretty soon after this podcast. It's um, my newest book. It's a cyberpunk retelling of uh, Sherlock Holmes, and uh, it's a lot of fun, so... You should, you should read it. You should. The order link is below, so go check that out. Uh, also, we have some news from Kyle Robert Schultz. There are new Afterverse books coming out this summer. He, yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he released a bunch, or three actually, covers, and they all look amazing. And I should have checked on how to pronounce these, so I'm going to butcher it. But I think it's The Curse of Charbonus and Schism. Is that correct? I, th- I, I feel like it's Charybdis, but I mean, it's <laughs> the curse right. of Charybdis. <laughs> I will type the title below <laughs> and y'all can decide. <laughs> it's it's uh, Greek mythology. It's based on the, it's, it's going to be great, though. Yes, <laughs> Whether yes. or not you can pronounce the title, it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> it is. So uh, you can check out his blog post on those below if you want more information. Uh, and then in the Hannah Heath News Department, I have a Skies of Dripping Gold audiobook coming out. Uh, it actually might be out by the time this podcast is released, so go check the video description to see. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be a 40-minute audiobook production by Brian Hathaway, and it's really good, and I think you all will really like it. Also, I have been publishing once a month a new chapter of my Mexican-inspired comedic space opera titled So I Accidentally Killed the Chosen One. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chapter three is releasing on June 3rd, and it is on Wattpad for free, so you can catch up on the first two chapters and then read the third one it com- when it comes out. Yay! And uh, finally, uh, Deck Matthews is combining the first three Riven Realm books into a single volume. So if you guys are into Brandon Sanderson or if you enjoyed um, Janelle Garrett's uh, Steward Saga, this is a great series to check out. Um, They're incredible, great fantasy. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So story time for the month of May. I know we've all been kind of locked inside. So what kind of interesting quarantine stories do we have? Yeah, my life hasn't changed that much. (laughs) (laughs) Same. (laughs) So yeah, I decided to kind of take a break um, from my blog, my bookstagram and a few other things kind of um, back off a little bit so I can finish writing Connection. Um, And actually, you know, if anything has changed, my life has gotten busier um so i'm not making that much movement but i'm getting there um but yeah my word counts not great but thanks to audiobooks i'm at least getting to read more (laughs) nice we will get there it's gonna happen it has to so it's it will (laughs) soon yep inevitable um I was thinking so hard. I like what stories do I have? What writing stories do I have? So I feel like I've been doing much more business related things like recently than actual drafting. But in general, I'm looking at the rest of my year and I'm getting to a place where I'm really torn what projects to pursue next. When like uh, and this is a new thing for me. I know a lot of authors complain about, you know, getting distracted by plot bunnies or shiny projects I always knew like what book needs to come next like I kind of went one book at a time until recently 
<laughs> last year it started to expand, especially as I was wrapping up my series. I had ideas for new ones, and now I feel like it's like out of control because I have I keep switching. Like I have several projects like that are on the horizon that I'm excited about some that I've even like started world building and things for and and having to decide which ones to prioritize is like so painful sometimes like I keep oh. switching like okay no this is the next one I'm gonna draft and then I'm like well but what about this other one <laughs> so I don't like it <laughs> no I don't I wish I could write faster because I feel like I'm at that point where I have the skill to write almost any story I want to which is really nice because I was not there a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> I still, there's so much to learn, but I feel like I have the skill to execute all these new kinds of stories. Um, but now I still, it still takes time, which is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be patient and be one at a time. Anyway. Yeah. It's so painful. It's like this twisted game of like, pick your favorite child. And I don't like it either. It so. is. <laughs> yeah, because you have to, you're like, do I want to wait two years to get that project going or out? And that sounds like such a long time. And at the same time, it's not, but it is. Anyway, it's just, or sometimes you're like, maybe that story would, if I waited longer, it'd be better. And like, you know, I'd be new things, but it's just hard. You have to make hard choices. I'll be all right, though. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... So for me, a thing that I had not realized before uh, being stuck in my house forever, um, I'm a huge homebody, so I don't generally feel the need to go out or talk to people, but I have realized that that's apparently not completely true, um, because I found myself in a writing session the other day um, having a full-on, like, out loud conversation with one of my characters, and was like, oh, oh no, (laughs) so apparently I need to talk to more people now. Um, because I do when I write and I think most writers do this we'll make like or actually I shouldn't assume this do you guys make face facial expressions when you're writing certain scenes yeah okay that part's not crazy at least so I usually do that but now due to like social deprivation that's gone up to a full new level and I'm like oh that's not great so if anybody wants to talk to me (laughs) come say hi now (laughs) I think think that's cute (laughs) (laughs) well good let's go with cute and not crazy I like that (laughs) All right, so our discussion for this month is indie author professionalism. So just to get us started, what do we mean by professionalism, and why is it important in the context of indie publishing? Yeah, so if you are an independent author, you've basically taken traditionally publishing houses out of the equation, and you become the publisher yourself. I think some people, it's so easy to just get a story up there these days that people forget that, but that you have become the publishing house. So now you're competing with other publishing houses in a sense. Um, So your professionalism, how you run your business and present yourself, it's going to mark you as a valid alternative to these well-known publishing houses (laughs) or not. And that sounds like a lot of pressure. And, and it's, um, we'll talk about more, you know, later. I know you guys are going to talk about, we have a lot, indie authors have a lot going for us in our favor. Um, but I think it is important to remember that, um, people want to have confidence in the product they buy, whether, you know, this goes across all business, whether that's a burrito or a lawnmower Mm -hmm. or a book, (laughs) um, you got to think, you have to remember your readers are customers. I think, um, you know, and they want to know that they're getting a good deal. And if you're going to offer them good customer service, I think that's a big one, um, that transfers over into book business as well as any customer service. So your website, your social media, your covers, your interactions with other authors and readers, it's all going to testify to um, the kind of foundation you've laid. Um, it, it bleeds through. It shows like the, the work that you do shows in all your interactions, I think. Um, so uh, more specifically in the indie pub community, um, where the threshold is so low for publishing, uh, you know, you can get jump on Amazon and put out a story you wrote in 10 minutes um, with, with a little cover. Um, <clears throat> but readers often want to know because of that uh, readers want to know if you've been vetted by other readers and customers, I think, um, you know, there can be a, a reputation for low quality in the indie author 
um, community because the threshold's so low. So having putting all the work into everything, um, including your website and just your overall brand, um, can give those readers confidence. And uh, um, if you have reviews and all that, which we're going to talk about later, uh, but it kind of shows that you have, you know, other people have bought your products and been happy. And <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that's my opening statement. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> yes. No, I totally agree. I think professionalism is just the overall positive image that you present of your business. Um, so it lets people know that this is something that you take very seriously and it's not just this kind of side hobby. Um, so this can mean having a nice book cover, a well-edited publications, a clean and consistent social media platform, having reviews and having more than like two reviews that are both five stars and like maybe from your grandparents or something. So it's very clear <laughs> that you've worked very hard to get your book where it is. And then other things too that people might not always think about, like responding to emails from industry industry professionals or even readers in a timely manner, that kind of thing. Um, it means running your indie author platform basically more like a traditional business rather than some kind of like hippy dippy artist escapade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we you know we live in the modern age uh, age of information, and it's really easy to be able to find. Um, you know, background on pretty much anyone you want to be able to engage with people on social media. And I think there's a lot of value in being able to interact with your readers on a more personal basis um, through the internet and social media. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being honest and personal and, and real. Um, but you do need to remember that your readers have to place a certain amount of trust in you to take a risk on your book, to spend money on you. Um, and that doesn't mean that you need to be um, a super fresh professional to the point that you look like a small business. So I, I would suggest the, the more the better. Um, but, you know, time is valuable. People's time is valuable. You know, you have to remember when people are spending their time on you, they're spending a portion of, of their life on you. Mm -hmm. um, and there has to be a certain amount of trust there. So if you, what you're coming across of it as online is uh, negative and catty, whiny, um, petty, or, or mean, um, people are not going to trust you to want to pick up your book. Um, and I can personally think of multiple authors who um, I like their writing style and I've enjoyed their books, but I don't follow them anymore and I won't pick up another one of their books because of their online presence. Yeah. Um, so on top of what Jill said about the author reader connection, I think too professionalism is really important for making business connections. Um, because as an indie author, we don't have a publishing house to direct us. Mm -hmm. So we have to go out and re make those connections ourselves. Um, and that, that to me is where professionalism has become very important. Obviously, it's important for other things, but this in particular. Um, so for instance, I used to work as a a live events coordinator for an online um, writing conference and then I've had a lot of like manager like roles and other writing related indie publishing things um and I found that there are some authors who definitely have business savvy and some who don't you know they don't respond to emails on time or uh, they can be kind of rude or harsh even in their emails or their social media and so I just mentally make a note and think, well, this is not somebody that I want to do business with because mm -hmm. they're either clearly not putting a lot of work into their business or they're just not pleasant to be around. And so I'm not really sure that's somebody I want to network with. Um, so the professionalism, by presenting yourself in a positive and business-like way, you're opening yourself up to networking opportunities that you might otherwise uh, be closing yourself off to. Yeah. So... Uh, one of the things that makes Indie Pub so unique is that we are both artists and entrepreneurs. So how do we go about striking that balance of being both personal but also professional? Yeah, I aim for my, my first interaction to be uh, professional and impactful. Um, so what I'm looking for is to be able to distill the most of my personality and also my professionalism into the first interaction as possible. Um, and part of that is to be instantly recognizable across my platforms. So I'm going to have um, similar colors, uh, images, and format 
Um, I use the same headers on all of my accounts and I don't think that everyone has to do that, but I, I feel like it's really useful for my readers to be able to recognize me right away. Um, I keep the same name and handle as much as possible across platforms. Um, and I avoid using any like instant turnoffs of my branding. So even though I do write horror as well as sci-fi, um, I don't have gore splashed across my pages. I don't use swear words right off. Um, I don't have uh, nudity and, um, you know, all those things to try and make it so that it's, it's a comfortable, welcoming uh, place for people to be. Um, and with my interactions, especially, you know, with things like tweets, Facebook posts, um, emails and newsletters, uh, I try to be honest and real. But I also want to keep a, a healthy dose of optimism and humor. Um, and I'm not naturally an optimistic person, so I have to put some extra effort into that to, to put encouraging posts and positive things instead of um, posting, you know, the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and I've also found that humor is really helpful in marketing, especially when it comes to interacting one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, but my own personality, personality is also to be direct and to be truthful and to try to be helpful as possible. Um, so I'm not trying to put on a face or a facade. Um, I'm just trying to, to post it, to, to put an added filter between that and um, to not just, you know, put the first thing that comes to mind, but think through what's going to be most helpful to my readers and, and to fellow um, business people and also what's going to put the uh the entire indie community in the best light awesome i was talking with another a fellow indie author about this the other day and my style of professionalism i refer to as chaotic good um <laughs> so meaning the internal workings of my platform are extremely businesslike and professional it's almost i've gotten it to the point where it's kind of a machine-like system um I have set publication dates, which may I don't always announce them publicly, but I have them in my head. Um, I put a lot of work into my cover design and getting good beta readers and editors. Um, I keep my social media platforms like very consistent and the contents the same kind of across the board. And I blog on a regular basis and I do the podcasts on a regular basis and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I respond to emails on time and all those kind of things. But the chaotic part comes in because I work really hard to present myself as more personal than professional. Because even though my uh, platform is run like a traditional business, I work very hard to make sure that it doesn't so much look that way. Because I think in the authors, we have an edge because we get to connect more personally with our readers than trad pub authors do. And so I'm really trying to um, beef that up with my own platform, because I want readers to feel that they can promote approach me, which is not always how they feel about traditional published authors. Um, so by letting my personality come through in a lot of uh, my blogs and social media posts and newsletters, um, things like fandom references, personal posts about having Lyme disease, uh, references to college life, I let, write, or let fans kind of see a little bit of my personal life. And then because they're invested in that, they tend to be a little bit more invested in my writing because they know that I'm writing from where I'm coming from, I guess. So like, so I accidentally killed the chosen one features a uh, college graduate who has a massive sense of humor. I'm in college, I have an expansive sense of humor. And so people are more willing to accept that yes, like this point of view, she can write from same thing with my disability representation in my stories, people know that I personally am disabled. And so they're more willing to be like, Oh, yeah, I would read that story because I think that she actually genuinely knows what she's talking about. Um, so, like Jill said, it all goes back to trust, and so by building those personal connections, it makes readers trust you, or helps readers trust you a little bit more, and then they're more willing to invest their time and money in your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there is a constant push and pull <laughs> with there's a lot of that, you know, in being an indie author, but I, I like how you mentioned being an entrepreneur, because that's a huge part of it, and um, it means you're always constantly trying new things but the professional side means you pretend you're already an expert <laughs> and so you're trying new things and, and make trying to make it look good <laughs> um it's good though uh because I mean the courage to try new things uh and I think that's one of the strengths of the indie others and the small businesses um so I think small business has always been more personal. I think right now, particularly, we're living in an age of personal marketing. People want to connect um, and make that personal human connection with 
um, in multiple areas, whether that's, you know, their favorite singers or actors. And, and now it's become more, I mean, you know, movie stars have been around forever, but now it's more like, oh yeah, that's my favorite director. And like Jill said, you can look up things about their life and who they are and their personality. Um, and, and fans are trying to make that connection. Um, so I agree with you, Hannah, that we have that kind of bonus as, as indie authors. Um, it's easier for us to connect directly with readers and for them to feel like we're approachable. I think that's a huge plus for our marketing. Um, I, I'm actually an extremely private person. <laughs> and so if you're thinking, oh, this all sounds terrifying, I get it. Because I was <laughs> like, um, I don't want to just go spilling my life over, you know, the internet. Um, uh, but I, I think there's a way to find that balance. Um, I think I, I sometimes struggle with this, maybe, and I think maybe other introverts do, with this kind of all or nothing mentality. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to say anything because I feel like I have to say everything, to be honest. <laughs> um, I get that way sometimes, you know, like I have to share my whole opinion or why I think about this, you know, to be honest about it. But you're like, but I don't want someone to know that much. The truth is we all have different layers of our life. Um, and you can share a single layer and be genuine about that. You know, you don't have to go share all 10 layers to be, I don't think it's fake. Um, I think uh, I used to struggle with that more, um, but you can be genuine about the layers you're willing to share. And that comes across to um, your audience. So, um, but boundaries are super important. I think like what Jill was talking about with filters. Um, um, I can't necessarily tell you where that line is. I do think everyone has to find it for themselves. I think the three of us have different boundary lines that we're comfortable with. Um, and, and that's fine. I think everybody has to figure out for themselves kind of where that line is. Uh, but, <clears throat> but like you, people don't want to be treated like a number. And that's why I think the personal is so important. Like you're talking about Hannah. Um, nobody wants to feel like you're just trying to push your books on them to get money. Like they see, you know, they don't want to feel like you see them as a wallet. <laughs> like, oh, buy my book, buy my book. And so that's the danger, I think, of being too professional standoffish is that they – you know, they feel like, oh, they just, they saw my, you know, especially on social media, they saw my Twitter profile and they see me as a customer right away. Um, so they like that humanizing of, you know, connecting as a person and realizing um, that. So that's where I think it's super important to balance the professional and the personal. So. Right. Yeah. And like you said, it's really important to be doing this intentionally like you don't want to be fake about it <laughs> you know like any information that you do choose to share about yourself should be sincere it shouldn't be like uh, oh if I share this thing it'll make people buy this book and like well yeah. like you can do that but that's not gonna work and it's also a little bit slimy so when you are <laughs> setting your boundaries make sure that you're respecting yourself but also that you're respecting other people because you don't mm -hmm. ever want to be like you don't want to be weird or creepy about it. So. <laughs> yeah. So what are some absolute musts for being a professional indie author? Um, I think for me, one of the biggest is respect. Uh, respect for yourself and others in your profession. It's just huge. You can tell um, respect for yourself, I think how authors talk about themselves and their books um, mm -hmm. is big. <laughs> if, an, if an author's trash talking their own book, like so if an author talks bad about their own book, I tend to believe it. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, you're like, oh, this isn't really good. And I'm like, okay, well, then I'm not going to read it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, like you would know, so I'll take your word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't think that's a good marketing strategy at all. I mean... Uh, and if someone does buy it out of pity, that's not a good <laughs> either. Um, so it's like how you respect yourself is is important, but also huge how you talk about other authors, other readers, other people in the industry. Um, Hannah talked about networking. Um, it's big for that because especially on social media, well, all the internet, what you say on there, it stays. You know what I mean? Like, and everybody can see it. I think sometimes if you're on a certain platform you get used to only interacting with the few people who comment and you think like oh this is my circle of 
we're all comfortable with each other but other people are looking on even if they don't comment I think that's a big thing you have to remember um so being respectful and and realizing that anybody could you know you don't know who you might want to work with in future and so you don't want to alienate other uh readers and it's just classy you know (laughs) just be classy and and (laughs) be respectful um but that's big um another one that came to mind for me um was a, a willingness to learn is is a big professional it's not maybe one you think of right off the bat um but after a few years in the business it's pretty easy to tell when someone has put time and energy and effort in and when they haven't um and and i think this one is an encouraging one it's meant to be because none of us are perfect and certainly when you start out you're not going to be perfect and there can be this huge pressure of like oh i have to have everything right before i, I launch forward and spend you know ten thousand dollars making sure it's like mm, you don't i mean if you have the money wonderful <laughs> <laughs> But if you don't, that doesn't mean you can't get started. And and it's not about being perfect necessarily, though we all strive for quality. Um, but you will make mistakes and um, you can learn from them and especially and correct them uh, and move forward. To me, that's a huge when I see another indie make a mistake, but then they change it or learn from it and move forward. And then I'm like, oh, wow, they're really serious about this. And it makes me want to check out like what they're doing because I think that's a huge, it's a great uh, quality to have to be able to uh, learn from your mistakes and correct them and move forward. And we're all constantly learning and growing. So, um, yeah, so the willingness to learn and um, is a big one for me. Yeah, I think um, those are all really good points. And But for those, you kind of have to interact with someone first. I think one of the biggest signs for me when I first stumble upon a new author, um, other than aesthetics, is the links. Um, and uh, so for me, one of the biggest signs that an author is taking themselves seriously is if they have a newsletter and if they have a website. Um, and if those are immediately linked somewhere, I can reach them easily. And then to take a step further, if I go on to their website and I don't have um, easy access to find their books within one or two clicks, I don't have an about me page. I just have maybe like a list of blogs, bad talking um, <laughs> you know, books they like, they dislike or movies they hate, you know, that's, that for me is a sign of unprofessionalism. Um, and I, I generally don't take the author seriously. If I go on their, their Twitter, or their Facebook, their website, and I can't find links to their books. Like if the whole point of them being a published author is to sell their books to me and I cannot find them quickly or find information about them. Um, you know, you might not be published yet, but you should have information about your book immediately available. Um, or about your intention to be a published author. Um, so if those things are not available immediately, I, I immediately don't take them seriously. Um, and that doesn't mean I won't interact with them and try to get to know them better. But that means that um, as far as actively pursuing them for uh, connections as an author or considering purchasing their book, um, I, that's that's a big no-no. You know, there's times that I go to an author's page and I'm like, okay, I genuinely want to support them. They've interacted with me great. I'd love to read their work. They've talked about it. It sounds amazing. And I just can't find it. Um, and I'm not going to keep digging. My time is too precious for that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even if it's just a books to read page, if, if you're not allowing your readers a chance to find your book, you're doing it wrong. Yes. You need to give people the chance to love you. So put your links everywhere. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then obviously the website is super important, but like Mm -hmm. the, if, if your website is so unprofessional and so disorganized that people struggle to even like find your books on there, or if they find your books, but your website is just like, I feel like we've all been here where we enter a website and it is just physically painful to look at because of how terrible it is. Like you do not want to have that website. Like that is going to be your first impression and it needs to be really good. So put some time into making a website. It doesn't even have to be fancy, but it does just have to be clean and easy to use. Mm -hmm. Um, And like Jill said, uh, link everything everywhere all the time. Um, Use the same branding materials if possible. So having your headers match across all social media platforms, um, using a logo wherever you go, having your email, having your 
email signature, or even use your logo or your links to your website is also important. Um, and then get get you some reviews. That's really important. <laughs> um, and I know that's intimidating and that's a huge like undertaking, but it is possible. I think PFW, we did a podcast on how to gain reviews as an indie author. So I'll link that below. Y'all can check that out. Um, but that's really important because I'm always instantly suspicious when I go on to a, like Amazon and see that an indie author only has like one or two reviews or no reviews and it's been out for several months. So I think, well, what, there must be something wrong here. And then I can't really trust the reviews because I'm not sure if that's just like a close friend who left at five stars and probably shouldn't have. Um, so that gets sketchy. So it's as far as presenting yourself well, it's really important to have reviews. Um, and then also, uh, like Beth mentioned, you don't have to be pouring money into this. Um, there are ways to look professional without spending thousands of dollars. But that being said, if you legitimately do not have the skill set to do something, then you do need mm -hmm. to find somebody to do it for you. So, for instance, if you cannot draw or Photoshop to save your life, like you're going to have to find somebody to design good book covers for you. Um, mm -hmm. Because that is it. The book covers are so important. And so if they look like you made them and cannot draw, then people are going to think, well, how serious are you actually about this book if you don't care enough to get it a good cover? Um, so that's very important. Um, and then having a clear aesthetic, too. Beth Wangler from PFW is a great example of this. You go onto her Instagram and it has a very clear look to it. It has bold colors, but it's kind of pastel-ish. And her website is the same way. And so it creates this, like, this kind of feeling of peace, but also boldness, which is very much similar to how her stories are. So if, I know that takes a lot of work, but if possible, work on developing a clear aesthetic that kind of presents who you are as an author and who you are, you are as a business. Um, that's, there's a lot of branding that goes into that. Again, we do have a branding podcast. I'll also link that one below um, because the branding is very important. If you don't have a clear brand as a professional, you're going to be hard to find. You're, it's going to be hard for you to stick out and it's going to be hard to get readers and reviews. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd second that, um, you know, research branding, research um, the essentials and the basics of business. You know, you don't have to be going and getting a degree in this. But like I said, we live in the, the age of information. There are countless YouTube videos, courses, blogs, um, books, anything you can find on on branding, on marketing, on, um, on the basics. Um, and for any business, one of the most important things is uh, quality products. Um, especially in today's age, you know, there's definitely that um, group of consumers, especially when it comes to certain books. Um, and, and I don't want to um, bash any genre in particular, but, you know, who who will, you know, read poor quality books because they're cheap. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to any product, people want quality. So mm -hmm. if you have a poor quality um, book cover, if you have not clearly have not put any effort into um, researching basic writing skills. Um, so for me, you know, if you if I pick up a book and it starts with a character waking up and and describing themselves with the mirror and it has like 50 typos in it. Um, I then clearly the, the author has not put any effort into research um, and probably doesn't even read that much because they would know those are huge cliches. Um, and, and, you know, these are, because we're talking indies, these are handmade products. You know, you have mm -hmm. to consider them as handmade products. Uh, so I give, a, you know, typos are no big deal for me. I'll usually read right over them. But there's, there's points where it's a little bit excessive where you can tell, mm -hmm. you know, maybe mm -hmm. they didn't even do a second draft. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, put the effort into researching how to become a better author, how to um, avoid cliches, how to, there's, like I said, there's countless, countless resources out there for you to, to be able to put some effort in and, and make a quality product. You know, if you want to make your name on being a good author, then first and foremost, you need to research and study and learn from others on how to be a good author. Yeah, I think, I think the takeaway from this and is that to be a professional indie author, you have to be an entrepreneur, which means you have to learn to teach yourself multiple skills and grow strong in multiple areas. And I think like as you guys are talking and thinking through other things I've seen and what turns me off from certain authors, it's like um, 
like if any one of these areas is weak, it kind of, and, and that sounds like a lot of pressure, but, but at the same time, um, it's like, uh, recognizing that readers time like we've said their time and their money is is worthwhile and they're not going to put it to something that they don't believe is quality and worth their time and their money um so like I, i've seen like you need to pay attention to all these areas you can't just be like oh i'm going to focus on a great cover but my blurb and it's going to be you know who cares about that and who cares about typos you know what i mean like you have to really and it's a lot of work it is but you have to put time in area and pay attention to all the areas um i at a live event i was doing someone came up to me and was like oh yeah i'm thinking about publishing a story <laughs> these people are just <laughs> They're all, I try to like, I, I, usually I immediately get this preconceived, like, oh, I know what type of person you are. And then I'm like, no, 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 you can't judge them yet. But, and just listen. But anyway, but, but they're just like, yeah, I have this story and I, and I, I want to publish it. So, you know, what platform should I use and what advice do you have? And so um, I kind of went in. They're like, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I just wrote it recently and, and I'd like to. I'd like to publish it. If I make a dollar, that's fine. If I make a thousand, that would be great. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. But I, one of the things I was talking to, I said, okay, well, my biggest, I mean, here you can use this platform, whatever, whatever. When you're ready to launch, one of my biggest pieces of advice is you give away some free copies to people who you trust to read it and review it for you, so you can have some reviews. And they like pretty much shrugged it off, like, yeah doesn't sound very interesting to me and I was like no 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 no, no. this is really <laughs> important <laughs> like reviews are a huge thing that help other customers to buy it and never and they like it's just interesting to see in that like to them it was like mm, no but I just want to put it up there so that it'll start selling I'm like um <laughs> there's just a lot of effort you need to put into all the areas marketing publishing um you know producing uh the covers, the, um, every aspect of it. There's so much competition out there, um, that if you don't put effort into all those areas, you're not going to stand out, I think is one of the big points to make. Yeah. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> no, that's great. You really do. You have to come out so strong just right off the bat. Um, so you need like everything and it sounds so stressful and it, it is, but running a business is stressful and that is what, that is what indie publishing is. But if you do your due diligence, like Jill said, if you research, even for me, I don't do a lot of like, I don't go out and buy books on indie publishing or anything, but I do find indie authors who I admire and then I kind of watch and see what they do. And then I think, oh, that works. I could use that or, well, that works for them. That's clearly not going to work for me or I'll look at what uh some less fortunate indie authors are doing and think oh well, that's real bad I want to make sure I don't do that <laughs> um, yeah so the, just uh, taking a little bit of extra time to study before you actually launch your book is so important um yeah yeah because just saying oh yeah I'm gonna put it on Amazon and hope for the best like well the best is not going to happen to you then I'm sorry <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah so along that note, uh, what are some just really big no-nos when it comes to professionalism, either that you've done yourself or seen others do, um, and what should indie authors be doing instead of those horrifying things? Yeah, I think other than um, icky book covers, um, <laughs> the, the, most of these things is going to be focused around social media for me, um, and that's because this... In this modern day and age, that's going to be the front lines of where you're going to interact with most of your new readers, mm -hmm. other than um, by word of mouth and recommendations, which you can't really control, um, and which is where we all want to be. Um, social media and, you know, Twitter, Facebook, um, newsletters, those are the areas where I see the most, um, the biggest issues. Um, so professionalism on those sites are really important. You know, if you just think about how you would interact with someone, if you're meeting them face to face, we act very different on mm -hmm. the internet and you're not going to go up to some stranger and be like, here, let me show you a lewd meme or, you know, tell a, you know, racist joke or talk about how much you hate your husband or, you know, how your kids are causing issues again or how, you know, you're on the brink of depression. You're going to die if someone doesn't buy your book soon. Um, 
those are those are areas where you probably need to talk to a, a friend um, mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe send a private DM to someone. Like, don't air your dirty laundry on mm -hmm. your social media. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's I don't even follow romance authors anymore because I cannot stand the nudity that pops up constantly on their feeds. So if a romance author follows me, I'm most likely not going to follow them back. Um, and that's just a sad fact of, you know, yeah, part of it's the genre and the branding. Um, but that's just a sad fact of, of what people think is okay to, to put on social media. This is your public face. This is your storefront, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and you need to be professional on those. Um, I, I think, um, to take that a level deeper, you know, the way you interact with your readers specifically, um, people who pick up your books, your target audience. Um, so, if someone gives you a negative review and you respond back, um, whether it's like blatant or not, whether you're like, <laughs> someone gave me a bad review and, and this is what they said and this is why it's not true, even if you're not directly responding to the review, um, <laughs> that's just like, that's unprofessional. That's not cool. And if you can't keep yourself from doing that, then maybe don't read your reviews at all. There has to be a level of safety for readers who pick up your book so they can feel safe to talk about their reviews. And this is why, you know, specifically on Goodreads, I don't interact with reviewers on Goodreads. I don't like when they say they're reading my books. I don't comment on their reviews. Um, I don't even say thank you for reading my book because I don't want them to feel watched. I don't want them to feel like, oh, the author's looking over your shoulder waiting to see whether you give them a good review or not. Um, so, you know, those, those are some big things, um, that I would say, you know, be aware of in your social media presence in particular, um, and it's on your newsletter because a lot of that expands to your newsletter. It's, it's a smaller audience. Um, but if you are airing your grievances or attacking your readers or complaining about, you know, I didn't make my sales and, and why do readers keep, you know, stealing my books instead of, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on your newsletter, um, you're attacking your readers in a place where they're supposed to feel safe and they shouldn't feel like, you know, they're coming to a battlefield when they open up your newsletter. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, the Goodreads reviews or reviews in general is a great point. I think it feels sometimes you trick yourself into it because you're like, oh, you usually a lot of times you get reviews from people, you know, or your friends or, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, I can like theirs and nobody else's. But it's and if you like the good reviews and then suddenly you get a medium review and you don't like it, it's so awkward. Yeah. <laughs> like I see authors do that. Like they're liking all the ones and then suddenly someone gives like a more critiquing and they don't like it. And I just feel like so awkward for everyone involved in this situation <laughs> because we all know that they read it because they read every, you know what I mean? So I think, I think that letting, even when readers are ridiculous and saying ridiculous things about your book, you just have to, you have to let the readers have their opinions and you have to keep your hands off of that. Um, so is a great point. Um, you can, you can separate your work and your personal on social media. And I think it's imperative. Um, social media is fun. If you want to use it for your everyday life with your friends, that's great. And share all your thoughts on everything. You can do that, but I think you need a separate work social media because that, um, otherwise the two will bleed over and it becomes messy and complicated. Uh, it's tricky because writing's personal. Um, and that's a good thing. And I think, um, going back to the boundaries, um, I think the personal attracts readers on one hand and you, your personal story can attract readers. So I, I definitely don't want to say don't share your personal story. Um, because, I know both of you have and in, in, in good ways and inspiring ways and it can be part of your brand. So like, but the line comes where um, if so, it, it turns into, oh, I'm not just sharing, you know, my personal story and how it impacts my writing. I'm, I'm giving a play by play of all my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so, and it's, it's just uh, like Jill said, you want to create a safe place. I think if you think about a traditional storefront, you know, a customer comes in, um, P employees are trained you don't just start spilling everything to them in that moment they came to buy a product you respect that you create you know a good environment for them um 
and and but there are boundaries to what you share there I think on social media it becomes confusing a little bit because uh the same people tend to come back more and more and you do, you create friendships, which is great. Um, but like I said earlier, you have to remember that, uh, those aren't the only people who are watching you and reading what you say. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the more, the more personal you become and share all of your thoughts and emotions, you may attract a very niche group of people like with the, the romance, if you're sharing nudity or sharing, you know, thing or either other authors or if your brand becomes, oh, I'm the person who trashes other books. It's hilarious. Some people will love that. Absolutely. But it's going to alienate a lot of people also. So I think you have to be aware of that. The more niche you become or the more you share about your your life's the ups and downs of your life or all your thoughts and emotions, you may get a small circle of people who love that. Uh, but yeah, you're going to alienate, a, I would say, a bigger group. Um from that and then of course that plays into the networking that we talked about <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you may have closed doors you didn't know that you closed and suddenly you know you want to network with other groups or authors and and they're not um so open to that so I think that's a huge thing for me um remembering and this is what I do sometimes even what I think about should I? Oh, this is fun. Should I share it on my social media? <laughs> Even with me, and I'm a very private person, but sometimes I'm like, eh. but I'm like, does this have to do with my books? I mean, not all of my stuff does. I share about my cats. I love my cat Max. <laughs> A safe place where it's like oh cat <laughs> but I how I do, even I remind myself of like oh no I created this account to market my books you know and connect with my readers um so I can private message my friend about this little thought that I'm having you know what I mean it's just good it's filtering it's professionalism and I think sometimes social media has broken down so many barriers in a bad way that you have to step back and remember, Oh, if I was working in a physical store, how would I treat my customers? Like, um, in the, and step back to that kind of a bit, um, to what those boundaries look like. I think it's just helpful. It doesn't mean you can't be personal or, you know, or chat or anything like that. Cause I think that's great. I, when I go into stores, I want to feel like a person, you know, I don't want to feel like they're giving me a script. Um, <laughs> Like when I go to get my coffee or if I'm at the store, I, I think it's fun when uh, I live a very friendly community. So they, they start chatting about the weather or like, oh, my goodness, so much traffic. I'm like, oh, I know, traffic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but people human and that's a good thing. And, and, um, and that's great. And, uh, but I don't want them to start dumping all their issues on me either because I have all my other issues. And I just came in to get a shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> So I think there's a sense and we need to remember that, yeah, the readers are customers and they, they in a sense, um, they want, sometimes they just want a fun, good book to buy, you know, and to keep, to constantly create an environment where you're approachable, where they don't feel like you've alienated them by a comment you made earlier, um, where they feel like they can connect to you and um, enjoy themselves. So it's, tr it is tricky. Um, but it's good. Yeah. That's all I had to say. <laughs> yeah. The only other thing I had was that uh, that I've seen that is a no-no. That's what we're on. <laughs> I, go off, I went off on tangent, I think. And this has to do with talking bad about yourself. But apologizing too much, I think, is another. Um, I think uh, you, a lot of indie authors, especially new ones, think, oh, I should own up to my mistake to show I'm professional, which there's a place for that. But I also want to point out that when you apologize, you, you also point out the negative. Mm -hmm. So whether some people may not have noticed at all, and, and when you do apologize, they will notice like, oh, I didn't realize that that had happened, but now I do. And I, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't own up to mistakes when you need to, but um, I, I've seen authors be tend to be over apologetic, um, especially if they have gotten negative reviews or negative things in the past, then suddenly they become like, oh, I should warn people about or I should apologize for certain things. And sometimes it's like, mm, no, you don't really need to do that. So that's just something I've seen. It doesn't, if you're over apologetic, it doesn't make you look more professional. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or along the same vein, like when authors will put down books of theirs that they published a while back and they'll use it as a way to explain like how much they've grown but then as a reader sometimes they're putting down their older books that I genuinely enjoyed and then it's kind of like oh well 
Oh, I liked that book and then it's kind of upsetting because the author is like talking bad about this thing that you hold very dear and so it's yeah. just kind of alienating it's not a great idea yeah I think you can you can just continue to write the next best book you know what I mean mm -hmm. just write the book that you think is better and let that speak for itself or if you've made a mistake sometimes it's you just correct it and move forward and and that shows oh that you learned and you corrected so I think sometimes in that sense the action speaks louder louder than words um but yeah that's a great point I agree with that yeah yeah and I did love your point earlier about like treating this as if it were an actual brick and mortar uh, mm -hmm. business because that does really help you weed out what you should or shouldn't be sharing um that being said I do think people need to be very aware of like how the internet works <laughs> mm -hmm. so one thing I see is I think indie authors not all of them but the professional ones do a really good job of recognizing like well I should not be sharing uh like political tweets or my political views or anything like that um online but then on Twitter Twitter shows what posts you've been liking and so mm -hmm. there are some people who have very clean tweets themselves, but then you see the tweets in your timeline that they have liked that are sometimes very like aggressively political or just aggressive in other ways. And it's even though it's not something they've tweeted, it does, it's always kind of a red flag for me. So just recognize that like nothing you do online is private. So if you don't want this to be connected to you in any way on don't want this to be connected to your writing platform, then just do yeah. not engage with that when you are logged into any of your social media accounts for your platform. Um, That's a great point. That will be, and it will be there forever as well. So like, just, you have to be so careful. Um, so I think that's important. Um, and I do have some cringy stories of terrible things I did, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I will share with you. Uh, just so people know not to do it. Um, auto DMs. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally did that when I was first starting to. I did too, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I forgot I did that too. And so I went yeah. back to message somebody and I saw that I had sent an auto DM like four years ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to just melt into the ground now. <laughs> so don't do auto DMs. Don't tweet replies and be like, oh, if you like that movie, like you would like my book. Like, don't, that's weird. Like, eh. you can tweet about your book and promote your book, but don't go just like, trolling other people's timelines to comment about your book when it's not really related unless they're asking for a book recommendation then that's great but don't be like I saw you were watching Lord of the Rings you might <laughs> like my epic fantasy like no that's it, it kind of plays into what Jill was talking about like you don't want your readers to feel like they're just being watched all of the time it's so uncomfortable um I did when I first published Skies of Dripping Gold I went around and would leave comments on people's posts on people's reviews and ask hey would you mind posting this on Amazon. And it worked. Uh, Skies of Dripping Gold has more reviews than my other stories. But at the same time, I realized later on, like, that is not a great idea. It didn't bother the people at the time because um, they were very close fans and followers. But I realized now if I tried to do that, that's going to come across as, like, it's going to make readers feel a little bit like I've been stalking them. And it's going to make them feel like they can't be honest in their reviews because they know that I'm, like, waiting for them <laughs> to drop mm -hmm. the review so just don't touch reviews on goodreads don't like them don't comment on them just pretend like you didn't see them don't tweet about them uh like don't screenshot them don't say hey i got a five star review and it was great or that's fine but like if you got a poor review you don't want to do things like yeah what i tend i just if got a negative review from this person and here's why it's wrong like well no <laughs> Something. Yeah, if they tag me in it on Twitter or something yes. and say, oh, like, here's my review on this book tagged, then it's, I think it's, that's one of the boundaries for me, that if they share it and tag me that they wanted me to see it, then I'll comment or be like, thanks. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, definitely. If you're tagged, or if they use a hashtag that you've created, yeah. if it's something where it's like, clearly, they have given you the go ahead to engage with them. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Um, but otherwise, I just think in general, you should probably leave those alone. Um, it's just, it's uncomfortable for everybody involved, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then just along those lines, you shouldn't ever be complaining about your readers or your reviewers, your sales numbers, or other industry professionals, it's just really classless and gross, um, it makes you look bad and insecure, 
It's mm-hmm. the big thing. It makes you look very insecure, which then will make people think that maybe your books really aren't very good because why else would they be that being that defensive? Mm-hmm. Um, so just like, or I've uh, seen authors' brands where it's like, oh, they look like they're doing pretty well, and then they comment and they're like can't believe nobody's buying my books and you're suddenly it's just they might have a better opinion of you than you think and why would you you know what I mean why would you it's like again pointing out the negative of why would you suddenly tell them all that you're actually not getting any sales (laughs) there's no I don't know (laughs) it just doesn't quite make sense to me (laughs) yeah no because that's gonna have one of two effects it's gonna mean people don't want to read your book now because it must not be very good because nobody's buying it or a pity sale and those are not ever really good because it it's not likely to create a lifelong fan. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can just add on to this, um, if you are not motivated by your own sales and your own professionalism and your own readers and your interaction with them, then please, please, please consider the indie, indie author community as a whole, mm-hmm. because your interaction with readers ex- especially when it comes to indies, because we're still up and coming, your interaction can sour a reader for the entire indie community. I have heard reviewers say, I had an author lie to me and say, you know, their book was a bestseller and then send me a review copy or say that, you know, they were with this big company or make it look like they were, you know, with the big five or whatever, and they will never buy from indies again, or that will sour anytime they pick up from an indie again. So consider that, you know, your professionalism is not just causing people to be turned off from you as an author, but you could be wrecking it for anyone else who wants to go down this path um so yeah as an indie author sometimes there are just people that I want to be like yeah I'm an indie but I'm not an indie like them (laughs) don't do it please we're begging you be classy yes be classy be positive it's really not that that aspect is not difficult and so really if you can do that you're already like so far ahead of so many other people um so just just put a little bit of effort (laughs) Yeah, sometimes uh, maybe this is funny and not relevant, but I think it's relevant. Just like sometimes I do tricks to remind myself, you know, because we get comfortable on social media or with what's going on. And sometimes in conversations on Twitter with different people or authors who I'm, you know, Twitter friends with, it's like I still imagine, you know, that I'm at a panel on stage. You know what I mean? Like, and we all have microphones. Now, what am I Mm -hmm. saying? Because it it can feel like this is a private conversation, but it's not. And so that's just something that I think about a lot, probably more than I should. Because I'm not like super famous, but I'm like, oh, I'm on a panel right now in this public conversation with my fellow indie authors. And we're having fun and it's great, but we're also being, you know, filtering what we're saying and being polite. And it's wonderful. (laughs) Yes, that's great. (laughs) Yeah. And don't let that that trick of thinking, oh, I'm not a big deal. So people are attack me. Like, don't let that get in your head, because I've definitely done that before where I'm like, ah, nobody cares what I say. Um, because uh, even if you delete it, that people could dig that up. So say you ever do get to be popular or your book becomes a movie or whatnot, that negative review, that attack could be dug up like three, four, five years in the future and destroy your business. So right. yeah. Yeah, plus it's a you healthy will fear. Never even yeah. get to that point if you are shooting yourself in the foot presently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, exactly. there's so many reasons that that's a bad idea. So <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right, we hope that was helpful to you. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move into the book club segments. What has everybody been reading this month? Book club. I haven't. I was surprised when I went to make this list because I felt like I'd been reading more and maybe I just slowed down recently, which is fine. I know I was doing some beta reading. I am reading uh, A Wind in the Door by Madeline Langell. Yeah. Um, and I I did, I zoomed pretty fast through A Wrinkle in Time. So I read A Wrinkle in Time, I think in middle school or high school. Anyway, but I'd never finished the series, so I'm trying to make work my way through the whole series this time, which is fun. Um, and then I'm partway through the audiobook of The Once and Future King. I think it's unfair. I think it's quite long. I don't. 
I, I made it through book one, which was The Sword in the Stone. Um, and I was like, man, like, I want to take a break, but it's going to be sitting on my Goodreads forever <laughs> that I'm only partway through because it's technic- it feels like it's technically, you know, three or four se- whole separate books. It's okay, though. I'll, I'll be okay. But I am going to continue, but it's probably going to be on my Goodreads for a long time. <laughs> it's all one book. yeah i it's been months of me not being able to find time to read things but this Mm -hmm. month i've finally gotten to read stuff so i'm reading uh something wicked this way comes by ray bradbury which i have never read before and it's amazing everything about it i just love the prose is gorgeous in particular so i'm really proud that this is like the book that i get to read after having not read for a while (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you should be proud I think <laughs> um, so I'm always juggling a lot of different books um, and I've been indulging in a lot of audiobooks lately as opposed to listening to podcasts when I've been driving to, to work and eventually I'll probably have to get back to podcasts and catch up but for now um, I'm enjoying my dalliance um, but as far as like books that I'm actually reading, um, so I'm reading The Bridge of Legends by Sarah K.L. Wilson. Um, and she was one of the first authors that I connected to on, when I started my, my journey. And I love reading her book. So she just is brilliant with world building. And this is no exception. And then I'm also reading Leviathan Wakes by James S.A. Quarry, which is actually um, a pen name for two different authors. And I'm sorry, I don't know their names. Um, but yeah, that's the Expanse series. And um, it's oh, it's yeah. amazing to get back into like the stuff I really love and to be like nerding out over science. Um, <laughs> so that's that's been a joy. That's awesome. All right, so that is the end of this podcast for the month. Um, You can find us Phoenix Fiction Writers at our website at phoenixfictionwriters.com and we are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PFW Books. And this podcast in particular is on iTunes and YouTube and Google Play and Spotify and other places. Uh, So you can find that linked below. You can find me personally on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website, hannahheathwriter.com, where from there you can find literally all the things, because like I said, Mm -hmm. websites are important, and I'm Mm -hmm. very proud that I did a good job with mine because it took me forever, so (laughs) go look at it. (laughs) Uh, Beth, where can we find you? I am on Twitter at ebdawsonwriting, and my website is www.ebdawsonwriting.com. And you can find me on most uh, platforms under J.E. Prazzi. And uh, the best place to find links to everything is at my website, www.jelaineprazzi.com. Yes. So all of those things are linked below. The June podcast is going to be on publishing and different mediums. And that's going to be with myself, Kyle Robert Schultz, and guest podcaster Laura A. Grace. So we're going to talk about things like audiobook production and manga writing because that's what laura a grace does and it's gonna be awesome so stay tuned for that uh in the meantime leave us a comment below and tell us uh your thoughts on indie author professionalism and your favorite tips and tricks yeah, we always love to hear from you uh, yeah so and then of course subscribe give us a thumbs up leave us a review on itunes we really appreciate it and i think that is it so thank you so much jill and beth for coming and chatting it's always great to hear you yeah thoughts. thanks thank you yeah All right, everybody, we will see you next month. Bye.